Hi, I'm Rob, and welcome to this episode of Spotlight on UNBC. The student body at the university continues to grow and now numbers close to 3,500. This year, there are new exchange opportunities, new scholarship programs, and new promise for the UNBC varsity basketball teams. There's also progress on the building front, with planning going ahead for a new lab expansion and a new research and development park. This summer, students had a number of opportunities, including an archaeological field school, and we'll have highlights from the dig just north of Williams Lake. All that and more is coming up on this episode of Spotlight on UNBC for October of the year 2000. Each year, the number of students attending UNBC gets bigger. This year, close to 3,500 students are attending classes here at the Prince George campus and at our regional campuses. The 2000 school year began with more students attending UNBC than ever before. They also had a number of new opportunities. For example, there's a new Apple computer lab that provides students with software to develop their own websites or produce digital video. There are also new student exchange opportunities. Last year, students had the chance to study abroad at a dozen universities. Now, the number is closer to 200. The big reason is UNBC's new membership in the National Student Exchange Program, which provides links to more than 150 American universities. Given the cultural, political, and economic links between Canada and the U.S., the program is significant. It's also an obvious partnership for at least one UNBC student. Tone Stakes is a new student at UNBC and a new member of the UNBC varsity basketball team after making the journey north from Southern California. I think the exchange program works out for everybody because you get to learn the culture, you get to learn how the people are, and you get to get past generalizations of like, like I mean, when I was coming up here, people, you know, like they say, you know, like it's cold up there, you know, people live in igloos and whatever, however it works out. But when I got here, I, I learned for myself on how everything, uh, how the culture is so much, you know, that whether it's different or the same, you know, I, I learned it for myself. And I think that it just helps me grow up as a man and also it helps me to, uh, so I can teach my kids, you know, and I, I don't know, I, I believe that, uh, that the more, the more, uh, let's say, like, the more experiences you can get into, the better off you are. One of those new experiences will involve playing with the fledgling UNBC basketball team, which itself is about to begin only its second season. I mean, honestly, I've never played with a better group of guys. Truly, they're, they have so much uh, ability, and then they have so much team, like, respect for each other. It's amazing how uh, the people really, the community really goes around the basketball team. The school really loves the basketball team. I mean, everything, we've just been blessed with a great community and a great place to play. The women's team, meanwhile, has welcomed a number of new players, including one who simply would not be at UNBC were it not for a brand new scholarship program. Christina Neufeld graduated from Fort Nelson Secondary with a 97% average and now has the chance to earn a bachelor's degree for free thanks to the UNBC Scholars Program. Actually, I flipped my university thing upside down because I was planning on going to UBC. I'm going to be a doctor, mm -hmm. so I wanted to go there to study science. And all of a sudden, there was a possibility that I could play basketball at UNBC and I could study here because it, it's so much closer to home. That's the biggest yeah. thing. Yeah. The UNBC Scholars Program recognizes the top grade 11 student at every Northern BC high school. Provided they finish grade 12 with at least an 80% average, UNBC scholars then have their tuition waived for their first year at UNBC. Then, if they maintain a B average at university, they can be exempt from tuition fees for a full bachelor's degree program. The total value is close to $10,000. Christina Neufeld has plans to go to medical school, but for now, she's focused on both UNBC and basketball. I want to do really well in school. That's my main focus is to do really well, particularly in the sciences. Like, I'm a little bit worried about my English class, but I want to do really well in chemistry and biology, because obviously those are the main courses for being a doctor, right? I want to do really well in those. And in basketball, 
My real goal is to start. <laughs> I want to be a starting center. I want to play post. I don't have a lot of boring hours. You know, I have school and I have basketball, and that's all I have time for other than calling my mom once in a while, you know what I mean? One of the most exciting new developments concerns the prospect of having a research and development park on campus. If it goes ahead, UNBC would have the first facility in northern BC dedicated to companies who are interested in research and development or high technology. To make it happen, UNBC has partnered with a private company to market, design and build the new facility. The, the economy of northern and central BC is really resource dependent, has been uh, throughout uh, history really. And I think what this can do is give us a step upwards in transforming that resource-based economy to a more knowledge-based economy. To, we, we won't, we, the resource industries will remain very prominent, there's no doubt about that. But there's no question in my mind that there are ways of incorporating knowledge-based advances, innovations with the natural resource extraction uh, economy so that we can become more competitive, we can become more diversified, we can hopefully bring in value added in a way that hasn't been conceived of previously. So basically to take the economy that we have and to transform it to a globally competitive, new, innovative kind of economy. The attractions for high-tech companies include opportunities to access UNBC's telecommunication infrastructure, skilled graduates and faculty research. The promise alone has been enough to realize a partnership with the Axor Group, a large company that has built similar buildings all across Canada. I think Axor as a partner is a wonderful partner because they have A, a lot of experience, B, a lot of contacts, C, they have a track record that I think is just wonderful. And what it really means to me is that uh, the university has a partner now of whom we can be really confident. They're professionals, they know this business. We will be marketing the uh, park. If we're successful in signing up tenants over the next few months, then we will, in fact, go ahead next year in the construction of the park. The R&D park is planned for the north end of the campus near the lab building. Watch for more developments. UNBC students are doing their part to develop the new high-tech industry in northern BC. Two UNBC co-op students are using their education and their work experience to raise awareness about a new industry called new media. There's a lot of local people that are very interested in this industry as well as students from the university colleges and other training institutes that are interested in getting into high-tech. So this is a forum for everyone to come together and people from uh, other parts of the province to come up and see what the possibilities of high-tech and new media are in Prince George. UNBC business students Bjorn Buto and Jeff Antonik will be showcasing the possibilities during their new media conference at the Civic Center in November. New media basically involves the convergence of different media, including video, on the internet. The goal of the conference is to help develop the industry in northern BC. We're looking for an attitude change. We want uh, people to really uh, feel that high-tech is a possibility in northern BC. And the work that the Innovation Resource Centre and the university with its new high-tech park uh, are doing can really change the attitudes of people. At the end of this conference, I want people to really feel that high-tech is a possibility in uh, northern BC. I think the first thing we have to do is look at what Prince George can offer high-tech businesses and also high-tech employees and what we can do in education and training through the university and also the college to start keeping employees in the north. Maybe there's going to be something along the lines of an e-commerce class or more in the terms of uh, um, systems development or MIS. I mean, I took an MIS class last semester, but I'd like to see more of that. I'd like to see more involved, you know, what is e-business? What is e-commerce? What is new media? We struggle with this concept of what, high t what is high-tech. Right? I think it's important that the business students are educated on the front end of the high tech sector, maybe not as much as the kind of back end which would be your computer scientists, but maybe somewhere where they can interact. And maybe it should be a requirement that they take some computer science courses or bring in some new courses that will educate them on that. Training is a key issue to recruitment and retention of all skilled employees, whether it's the healthcare or new media industries. 
The full range of issues related to the further development of this industry will be examined during Bjorn and Jeff's new media conference in Prince George on November 17th. Check out their website for more info at innovate.bc.ca slash new media. Everyone is welcome. Nowhere in northern BC is the need to diversify more apparent than in Tumblr Ridge. A UNBC student and a graduate of the university are both hoping to make a difference. This is an image synonymous with Tumblr Ridge. It's the Quintet coal mine and its creation was responsible for the creation of Tumblr Ridge. It's true the community was literally built on coal, but the black stuff will not be a part of this community's future. With Quintet closed and the closure of the Bull Moose Mine in the near future, Tumblr Ridge is experiencing an economic crisis. The residents are eager to diversify, and a group was set up to help make an economic transformation a reality. One of the members is Ray Prue, a UNBC graduate who's now a municipal councillor here. He first began looking at Tumblr Ridge's many challenges when he was a student in environmental planning at UNBC. The creation of the Tumblr Ridge Community Diversification Society came basically out of an interest to do something with the knowledge that we had been provided in university. Uh, we wanted to see if it would actually work. And we uh, got together with one other person from the school, uh, my partner and myself, and, and decided to focus on Tumblr Ridge because I felt that uh, uh, my heart was still here in many ways and I felt that uh, with some work I think we, we could make it through the, the tough times that it was going through. Ray grew up in Tumblr Ridge and returned home after graduating from UNBC. In addition to being a counselor, Ray works with youth and his interests in diversification have led him to ecotourism. A lot of people kept coming back to tourism because we have a lot of uh, really beautiful areas around here and we felt that it was an untapped resource and something that could really be uh, utilized. Uh, we got together with a group of people and a lot of people figured that uh, they could go into business themselves but it was scary to do it alone uh, and if they could do it as a group or as a, uh, uh, a larger body then uh, it would take the fear out of doing that so that's why we came up with the cooperative concept uh, basically achieving together what we can't do alone. It's almost a see it and you will come kind of idea. The area around Tumblr Ridge is packed with trails, fishing, hunting and general sightseeing opportunities. The overall quality of life is key to enticing visitors and new residents alike. Our quality of life is unmatched I believe to, to many other communities and I think that's basically our common thread and our selling point to uh, surviving. Al Galbraith couldn't agree more. He's the one overseeing the big housing sale in Tumblr Ridge with houses selling for about $25,000 each. By the middle of the summer, nearly 300 homes had sold, about triple initial expectations. Way beyond expectations, yeah. We'll probably be um, four or 500 units. We're gonna start our condos next week and uh, I've got 190 people who wanna buy 52 units, so, I, <laughs> so that should be fun. Driving around Tumblr Ridge today, it's easy to spot all the sold signs in the windows. Many houses are still for sale, but Galbraith expects to have the entire sell-off complete by this time next year. It's going to be a thousand by this time next year, there's no doubt about it. We'll have everything sold, there's, there's no two ways about it. One other thing is certain, the kinds of people living in Tumblr Ridge is changing. Who are the people buying all of these houses? Some are retirees from all across Canada and even the U.S., but there are also young families eager to start new businesses in a place where they can actually afford to buy a house. How will these new people shape Tumblr Ridge? That's a question UNBC student Lana Sullivan hopes to answer. Traditional mining town models suggest that uh, there's a boom and a bust. So as soon as the company comes in, there's a massive boom. As soon as the company leaves, there's a massive bust. And uh, on March 1st, 2000, there is an announcement that Quintet Coal is going to be closing and so that will lay off about 500 people in town and because that company is going to close, according to traditional mining town models, it says that the company or the town will close as well. Um, my argument is that it, that won't happen, but because in Tumblr Ridge it was developed very 
and very recently. It's a very well socially planned town and uh, so as a result there's brand new infrastructure there that's beautiful, modern, ample facilities and recreational opportunities. And also there's a core group of residents here who are committed to this place and who have created a sense of community and have developed roots in a, in a place that is not stereotypically supposed to have roots. So what happens next? Will the town survive? What will be the new engines of economic growth? How will the new residents contribute? And how will they get along with people who have lived here for many years? Many questions remain to be answered, but many of those same questions apply to other small resource towns. Many communities have similar challenges around diversification, and the lessons from Tumbler Ridge may be applied right across the north. Very often people think in resource towns that they're, they're a concept of the past, they don't exist anymore, but they're still extremely important parts of the landscape, of the Canadian landscape, and the, particularly the northern Canadian landscape. And I think that by contributing to uh, the research in this area, will contribute to a greater understanding of what rural Canada is all about, and particular, in particular what northern rural Canada is all about, and what northern rural Canada um, is involved with. So I, I think that that's really important. And what Northern Rural Canada needs to do to survive? In a lot of ways, yeah, in a lot of ways. It's, it's definitely about um, lessons for the future. Yeah. UNBC lost one of its early leaders in July when founding president Jeffrey Weller passed away after a brief illness. Hundreds attended a memorial service held for him at UNBC in September. The library perfectly symbolizes the spirit of adventure, of questing, of contemplation, and of sheer energy that was Jeffrey's spirit and was the spirit that I believe Jeffrey understood as the spirit of the North. It is therefore fitting that the UNB Senate, a UNBC Senate and Board have approved the naming of the UNBC Library as the Jeffrey Weller Library. The plaque that shall appear at its entrance will bear the words of Christopher Wren's famous epitaph, Si Monumentum Requiris Circumspice. Translation, to see his monument look about you. And as you look about you, you will see Jeffrey's monument in the physical presence of this entire campus, in the pulsating life that fills its halls and its classrooms, in its friendly informality, and especially in the spirit of the North that is captured in its library. Only a few weeks before founding President Weller passed away, the university celebrated its 10th anniversary. Clearly, the university would not have reached its 10th birthday without the early work of Jeffrey Weller. Many of the other founders attended the festivities, including original governors and supporters. Presentations were also given by current UNBC President Charles Jago and Vice President Academic Deborah Poff, who outlined UNBC's brief history and what is planned for the future. UNBC's Alumni Association has a stake in UNBC's future. They've illustrated their ongoing relationship with UNBC by planting flowers around the campus. I think it, it's, it's a good chance for people to see, um, to encourage donation back to the university, to see what their money is going for, as well as uh, promote a little bit of beautification of our campus. So we don't have a lot of landscaping going on. And, and as well, as, a, as you can see just here today, a good sense of community, people getting out. We're, we're having fun. It's not a formal event. It's just to get people out and, and get people together. UNBC now has about 1,700 alumni, starting with the first graduates in 1994. The Alumni Gardens project is being funded by alumni donations. Typically what we only do is the one time a year annual alumni reception and then sometimes there's resume writing and that kind of things but those are more formal and almost structured things and so this is the first thing that we've ever had where we've thought about something outside of that once a year event and hopefully this will be biannual or biannual, how does that work? Um, and So one in spring and then one in, in the fall that we can continue to keep doing this as well as it helps contribute towards our McLean's rankings for alumni donations. Mm -hmm. So the, the buck-a-ball idea so people can come out, donate and plant and leave a legacy. 
Advanced Education Minister Graham Bobrick paid his first visit to UNBC in September when he toured the campus and visited with a number of UNBC students. It was a chance to get feedback and answer questions. Topics included the tuition fee freeze, capital expansion, and increasing access to popular courses. In October, the university will be hosting a landmark conference dedicated to preserving the Aboriginal languages of Northern BC. On October 14th, the university will host festivities for Aboriginal Languages Day, a chance for language instructors and the general public to meet and discuss strategies for preserving Aboriginal languages and cultural identity. Well, this is the first time that UNBC will have brought together all of its language instructors. Now, UNBC uh, teaches uh, at least 17 different languages across the north and northwest, northeast and north central regions of the province. Uh, it being the first time that we're bringing the language instructors together, as well as instructors in other educational settings, uh, this will uh, give an opportunity for us to develop a vision as to how we can retain our languages into the future and how we can support each other to make sure that those languages uh, uh, thrive and, and uh, survive well into the future. In British Columbia there are 27 linguistic groupings alone of Aboriginal people languages. Um, there are about 60 different linguistic groupings across the country. So the larger numbers of language groupings in this province uh, suggests that there are smaller numbers of people that actually speak the languages and so yeah. there's a real concern that over the next uh, couple of generations that many of our Aboriginal languages will be lost. The public is welcome to the Aboriginal Languages Day festivities at UNBC on October 14th. For some UNBC students, it was the experience of a lifetime, spending seven weeks on the banks of the Fraser River just north of Williams Lake. It was UNBC's first archaeological field school and provided students with a hands-on lab for practicing archaeology. The University of Northern British Columbia was invited to join in partnership with the Caribou Tribal Council to uh, put on a field school. And as a result, it's uh, both uh, First Nations students and university students who are working together here. And that's been an extremely positive experience in terms of uh, building relationships and understanding the different perspectives that surround archaeology. Because in many cases, archaeology is a, is a controversial subject and First Nations, uh, rightly so, uh, would like to have more involvement in what goes on in archaeology. And this field school is one of the most uh, perfect examples of how that, that working relationship can develop. Where we are is the Hatsul Heritage Village at Soda Creek, an area used for thousands of years for fishing, gathering, and food storage. And in terms of uh, an archaeological site, this is one of the most significant places on the Fraser River that I've seen. It's essentially an archaeological site from the Fraser River right up to the highway, which is hundreds of meters in elevation and several kilometers in distance. And that represents the intensity of use of this place, how long it's been used and how many people have been here using this place. The intensity of use has made this area a perfect location for this kind of field school. The students were involved in two different types of digs, a trench that we'll see in a couple of minutes, and an excavation based on a grid pattern. Bro, well, right now, uh, we're down to about uh, 80, 90 centimeters. I'm just uh, scraping away at the floor of my uh, unit here, and uh, I've unfortunately hit a bunch of bedrock. So I am uh, almost at the end of my uh, troweling experience here with my partner Jen who is not here at the moment and um, at this point in time we can't go any farther so after this uh, we'll be uh, uh, fixing up the walls, uh, straighten out the floor and then we'll be taking pictures of, uh, of uh, the profiles on the walls which means the different layers. Like this, this layer um, is a bit darker usually when they're a bit darker that means they're a little bit more organic right. usually and this is where you're gonna find a lot of uh, cultural it's cultural layer you're gonna find a lot of lithics like flakes um, from making tools you're gonna to find uh, hopefully find like charcoal and stuff like that that kind of layering is also evident in this separate area of the site where students worked on a large depression it was 
quite certainly uh, a cultural, what we call a cultural depression. It was made by humans, but it was uncertain as to how old it was or how it was used. The purpose of, of a trench is to get a, a quick view as to, in, in terms of a profile, of what created a feature or, in this case, this depression. And what we wanted to do is excavate quite uh, rapidly in a 50 centimeter wide trench right across the entire depression from one side to the other. And in doing so, uh, we were going to expose the stratigraphy or the layers. And in this profile, we can very clearly see the stratigraphy or layers that were formed um, in this area. And what we have at the very top is, is this layer here is just the root mat, the grasses at the very top of the, of, the, of the wall. And beneath that, you can see that there's a layer of soil that comes along right here and into the back of the, of the trench that's sort of dipping downwards. And we didn't find any, anything in that particular uh, layer. But beneath that layer, where you have a, um, a harder, whiter um, sediment or matrix coming up, and it sort of comes right up into this uh, top part here. And what that forms is the, the rim of, these, of this depression. And all of this sediment that is in this sort of sloping layer is the sediment that was removed from the depression and shoveled up or, or moved up onto the top and created this sort of rim and then sort of uh, the, went back into this area right here. And then later on over the years, um, slope wash or sediments came down from the hillside and sort of filled over top of that particular layer. And inside, inside this layer, we found all kinds of artifacts, pieces of uh, stone tools, uh, flakes of, of uh, stone material, as well as a lot of fish bones, a lot of salmon bones, it appears to be. Different methods are used to literally screen out the artifacts from the dirt. All right, now, um, today I've found um, some uh, type of animal bone, a small animal bone, and then I know in my datum corner I found a whole, whole little concentration of small fish bones, or appear to be fish bones, mm -hmm. and uh, that took me uh, quite some time to go through in a screening just to pick it out with, uh, with the, all of the uh, small, small bones that yeah. were in there. Just, just to be uh, thorough is, is uh, something that needs to be done with this type of work just for one of the main objectives of the course was to teach archaeological methods to UNBC students. But this course was far more than a few credits on the road to completing a degree in anthropology. The partnership with the Caribou Tribal Council has meant that local First Nations have had the opportunity to learn about archaeology and become certified to manage their own historic sites. There are very few, if any, archaeology um, majors from First Nations students that I've heard of. And and um, since, uh, since I've, I've got an interest in this, I feel that I'd, I'd like to pursue that as a, as a career, as being uh, um, living ha on half, uh, half the time, uh, half my life on a reserve, and then the other half on. I've really kind of seen, seen that I haven't really learned anything as a First Nations person about, about my, own, my own upbringing or my background in history. And, and just learning, going along with the uh, UNB students, learning my own history and culture is just uh, mind-boggling of, of some of the stuff that I don't know and that I thought I really knew stuff about. And, and just going along with that learning experience with the UNBC students is just, just excellent, excellent for, for both peoples, I think. Thanks for watching this episode of Spotlight on UNBC. Tune in to this channel next time or watch our stories on the World Wide Web. You can check them out at www.unbc.ca.